Welcome everyone. We're going to give just a minute for some more folks to join before we get started. Hi, welcome. Um, I'm excited that you have all joined us this evening. I'm Kelly. Um, I'm a member of the community team at Guidepost Montessori, and I also happen to be a former Montessori teacher and a Montessori kid. Um, I first want to go over a couple of housekeeping items before we get into the meaty part. Um, we're going to be recording this webinar, just so you're aware. I wanted you to know that, um, and it will be made available after our series runs. Margaret, our speaker tonight, will be referencing a number of resources um, that are available in the handout section of the panel, which is probably to the right um, of your screen, and you can download them during the webinar. If you have any questions um, as Margaret is talking, please write them in the questions tab that you'll also find on the panel, um, and I'll relay them to Margaret during the question and answer session. Let's go ahead actually and test that out. So if you can find that and type in where you're joining us from, I know that we've got a huge contingent from Toronto um, because originally Margaret was going to be delivering this as a live talk um, here on the same date, but she graciously agreed to switch over the format and the topic for this much broader audience um, during this quite unusual time. So I, I really appreciate her flexibility. And in addition to Margaret, um, who I'm getting ready to introduce, I'm also joined by my colleague, Edward Lenny, who's on our international team. Um, he's working on some exciting projects, hey Edward, um, both domestically and internationally. Um, and he's gonna speak with us later tonight about one of those projects, Essential Care for Essential Workers. So I'll pop back later, but I just wanted you to know who he was. Um, and now, without further ado, I wanted to welcome Margaret Whitley, who is a lifelong Montessorian, and she's going to share a little bit more about herself now, so I don't want to spoil it. Um, you're definitely in for a treat, and I'm going to turn things over to you now, Margaret, and I'll see you a little bit later. Thanks so much, Kelly, uh, and good evening, everyone. Just before we get started, um, I just want to say uh, I want you tonight to use this webinar for whatever you need at this point. It might be just a chance to pause and regenerate yourself or to get a few more ideas or even just to reinforce things that you're already doing at home with your children. But please do not come away from this thinking you are not enough. Just by being here tonight means you are doing more than enough. So let's begin the formal part of this presentation. Just over a couple weeks ago, this was the slide I was planning on using to introduce my presentation tonight in Toronto, as Kelly just mentioned. Obviously, tonight's talk, though, is going to be much different. The world has completely changed in the last couple of months since I started my planning, let alone the last couple of weeks. But one thing I want to assure all of you who are listening is many, many of our children who have and will continue to experience Montessori and or opportunities for independence have more easily adapted to our present realities than many other children who experience a more adult-directed, defined task approach to education and to life. As Yuval Noah Harari speculates, the most important skills our children will need for both today and the future are resiliency, adaptability, and self-knowledge. I think right now, we are all doing our best to draw on these skills, and certainly some of our Montessori elementary and middle school students can show us the way forward in this. So we decided instead to spend our time together tonight talking about supporting ourselves, each other, and to enable, to enable us to best support our children in these uncertain times. 
So here are some of the things we'll talk about tonight. I'll give you a few bit more information about who am I. I want to spend some time checking in with ourselves. How is our oxygen level or do we need some boosts? I want to talk about checking in with our children as well. I'd like to offer you a few reminders of our children's needs based on their ages and stages. And for each of those ages and stages, I'm going to offer a couple of ideas that are not specifically schoolwork. And then we'll certainly allow lots of time at the end for questions and answers. So to get started, as Kelly mentioned, my name is Margaret Whitley. And here I am last summer, very different times, it seems almost decades ago, in the backyard of my home in London, Ontario, Canada, with my very old dog, Josephine. I have been in Montessori education one way or another since 1966, well over 50 years. I attended as a child and lived in a family whose parents founded a Montessori school. Despite my initial rejection of anything associated with my parents, I traveled to Bergamo, Italy for Montessori elementary training in 1985. Sadly, this part of Italy and the Bergamascans have been one of the hardest hit populations so far with COVID-19. Since then, I taught all levels of elementary, started the first Montessori middle school in Canada, and worked in many areas of school administration. I served on the Canadian Council of Montessori Administrators Board, headed up its school accreditation team, and have taught at the Toronto Montessori Teacher Training Institute. I was also the executive director of my family's large Montessori school for 13 years. I'm the parent of two grown children who both attended Montessori for 12 years. And today I write, speak, and consult with parents, leaders, and educators and I'm completing a book, A World of Difference, How Montessori Influenced My Life. And here I am with one of my very first Montessori teachers who I re recently visited, Mr. David Duthright. Okay, let's check in. How are you doing? Not your kids or a partner or even extended family or friends, you. As individuals, we all will react differently to these unique and difficult circumstances that are we are being presented with today. Don't let anyone tell you how you should feel or be. It is all valid. Brene Brown reminds us that new is hard and this is all very new. But sometimes when we are faced with the new and we are not comfortable, then we might wanna give up. But when we stop working with the new, we stop growing and stop being vulnerable. Through my many years of working with elementary and adolescent students, I regularly reminded them, you have the strength to come out the other end of this. And when you do that and look back, it arms you with more strength for the next time. Sometimes we have terrible expectations around how we do things the first time. Tackling something new usually takes time and patience. Let's start by naming your fears and frustrations. I invite you right now to take a few minutes to jot down how you might be feeling at this very moment. Certainly continue this later on and we'll talk about this as well later on in the webinar. But if you're interested in more on this, check out Brene Brown's new podcast, Unlocking Us. It seems very timely. Okay, let's start with this. My first suggestion is avoid too much media. It may be tempting right now to keep CNN or CNBC or CBC on 24 seven to not miss the latest update as things seem to be changing every nanosecond. I would recommend instead checking it once or twice a day and keeping it off when younger children are around. For social media, the same. It can consume you and for many be sucking your energy away to tackle the day. Take advantage of, of the choices you do have versus the ones you can't choose. Your amount of media consumption is one of them. And it's a choice I continue to struggle with just like possibly many of you every single day. In a recent New York Times article, the adults and children who emerge the most intact emotionally and physically from very difficult situations are those who practice kindness and compassion, but also keep routines, love and structure. Observe your old schedules or create new ones, but ideally structure your days. Keep consistent at things like bedtime, meals, school time, work time, getting dressed, 
As tempting as it might be to stay in your PJs all day, I recommend most days, or even maybe just the weekday, weekdays, to get up in the morning, shower, eat healthily, get dressed, put on your lipstick, shave, or do whatever signals normalcy. This will be not only important for you, but also for your children. This article, like many other resources, as Kelly mentioned at the beginning, will be included at the end in the resource list. From this particular New York Times article, Jessica Gross states, for those who are lucky enough to have a stable home life, this period won't be easy on them or on their children. Children who are prone to anxiety may find this period especially challenging, but all the experts I spoke to emphasize routine and simple affection are important. I should have mentioned this before, although it's likely obvious from my introduction. I am not a counselor, a psychologist, a therapist, or any of those other professions, but I do have years of working with children and family, and it's provided me with some practical solutions that might help at this time. So start by acknowledging your feelings. You might be angry or fearful or frustrated or even um, grateful. Be kind and patient with yourself. Recognize everything that you are juggling. Care for yourself. Even a few minutes of time alone, even five minutes will help, whether it's for meditation, exercise. The more we care for ourselves, the more we can better care for others. Do something also which helps to put panic or anxiety aside. The other day, there was actually a great article in the New York Times that talked about the increase in people breaking, baking bread because it gives them something to focus on and be distracted with. Think as well of the things you can do that you can't normally do. Maybe have dinner together every night, make music, have a dance party, or even read to each other. Also, when you do something, it also helps you to move through your own feelings, just like your children. Here I offer a sample of resources that will come out after this webinar, as I've said before, along with their links. There are many tools listed here, specifically on the Canadian Association of Mental Health website on coping both for us as adults and again, and how to assist our children. Specifically to meditation, I completely struggle with this myself, but for some trying to do this, these links might also offer some ideas. There's also the popular app Headspace, which offers many different types of meditation and guidance. Practicing meditation might also help your children. Seeing you try this or do other activities like yoga or exercising or just finding daily gratitude with them might also help them to be calmer. Later, you can try one of the many online YouTube videos on meditating with your children as well. If trying to meditate, make sure you set a timer or something that tracks the three or five or 10 minutes so that you and your children can check in with their body or listen to the music or count your breaths. Later, we'll, we will briefly talk about this, but in Montessori, we have lessons in silence and even breathing activities for children to attend to their own breathing. For younger children, this could be trying to, hold, trying to breathe in for a count of three, hold it for three, and then breathing out for three. Then you could move on to four or five over time. This also could be a valuable tool for our older children, serving them generally when stressed or anxious. Kids are always learning. What they're learning right now is how adults respond. All of this leads to checking in with our children. Two weeks ago might have been very different than today. Our younger children li generally live in the moment, so they won't necessarily have in their mind the many things we might. Ideally, considering their perspective and the developmental stage is helpful when trying to care for them. For example, our elementary children have amazing imaginations, moral concerns, and take on worries just like us. Helping them to navigate these as well are important. There are many, many online resources about what to share with children, including when and how, like as I, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the Canadian Association of Mental Health, or many of the reliable parenting news, newsletters like the New York Times or the CBC or Today's Parent. One adage is asking them what they know. 
Then what would they like to know? Don't burden them with information they do not need or are not interested in or curious or worried about, but also be honest with them. If grandma is very sick, don't say everything will be okay because it might not be. And then if it isn't, this undermines their trust in you. This is also the same advice I've offered parents over the years about talking about human sexuality, death, or other difficult life moments. It is some of the very same advice that I offered after 9-11 for Sandy Hook or the many other tragedies that seem to have consumed the news cycle over the past 20 years. Most young children will, or kids will remember how their family home felt during the coronavirus panic more than anything specific about the virus. Our kids are watching us and learning about how to respond to stress and uncertainty. Let's wire our kids for resilience, not panic. Although I don't wanna to add to your burden, but this is an opportunity for children to learn from you how to cope with stress and uncertainty. This offers the opportunity, as I said before, to develop resilience and adaptability. What we planned for last week, month, or months ago may be impossible or may now look very different. More than ever, this is true now. So as I said before, talk to them. Check out some of the online resources through the many, many public, publications like Today's Parent or New York Times Parenting Newsletter. There's a few links specifically here about talking to your children about the coronavirus. Keep in mind that younger children under six are generally in the moment, but older children six to 12 are thinking about what things mean. In these links, it also includes a CBC, which is Canada's equivalent to, NAP, the NPR, to NPR, short 90 second video explaining the coronavirus for elementary aged children. I actually watched it and learned some things myself. And here's a summary of a few specific tips to consider when talking with your children. Acknowledge their fears. Explain the risk of getting the virus for them and others. Show them the steps they can take and you are taking to keep them safe. Limit their exposure to TV and social media. Involve them in helping out in many ways. And explain to them about physical distancing and not sharing food, drinks, makeup, or personal items. Here are also several other resources specifically about why and how to wash hands properly. Check out the soap and pepper demonstration and even try it yourself. It is a fun three minute activity or get your elementary children to watch it and do the demonstration for you. I also realized when I watched the CBC News report included here that I wasn't even washing my hands properly. Recently, I checked in with some neighborhood children to show me how they're washing their hands and asked them to watch me do the same. And then we offered each other tips. Of course, we did this online though. I came across this illustration and quote about a week ago and thought it might be a lovely thing to share with you at this time and to see some of the opportunities as well that this crisis might present. There are also YouTube videos of this same poem if you wanna check them out and share them with your children. And the people stayed home and read books, and listened and rested and exercised and made art and played games and learned new ways of being and were still. And listened more deeply. Some meditated, some prayed, some danced, some met their shadows. and people began to think differently. And the people healed. And in the absence of people living in ignorant, dangerous, mindless and heartless ways, the earth began to heal. And when the danger passed and the people joined together again, they grieved their losses and made new choices and dreamed new images and created new ways to live and heal the earth fully as they had been healed. Think through, if you can, with your children, how you can now do home, play, school, and work together in your new reality. So we're gonna talk for a few minutes about Dr. Montessori's model of child development. She called them the planes of development. 
Today, we might call them stages or periods, but they give us some insight to who are our children. Here is a diagram showing her model from the Perugia, Italy teacher training course in 1955, 54, sorry. These stages or periods are the same for children today. Dr. Montessori observed that children developed in approximately six year cycles, and each cycle has different characteristics, needs, and sensitivities. She observed, for example, that children from zero to six are in a sensitive period for language, order, sense, uh, education of their senses, movement, and minute objects. Children from six to 12, our elementary age children, are sensitive to abstraction, imagination, morality, and justice, culture, and social or peer interaction. And our 12 to 18 year old children, if you have some at home as well today, we will call them adolescents, are fascinated by social justice, heroes and role models, personal dignity and belonging. Thanks to David Kahn from the former North American Montessori Teachers Association for this other graphic representation of our four planes of development. When we look at these four planes, we see that the first and third planes are periods of dynamic psychological change, which is why Dr. Montessori used the color of red to identify these planes. The second and fourth planes, although still very active periods, tend to be calmer, which is her reason for using blue. Think of the possible emotions at each period or plane, as well as the rapidity of change. Personally, over my years in education, I saw the frequency of dealing with challenging emotions often the greatest in the zero to three period and the 12 to 15 period. So if you have children in any of these age groups, this information may help you better understand how they might be reacting to changes and what their needs might be at this time. So let's talk about our different stages of development or planes to, of development. We're going to start with our zero to six year olds. Children of this plane absorb everything around them. One of Dr. Montessori's most frequently cited books is called The Absorbent Mind. So some of their needs and characteristics for children from zero to six are for order, for, which requires things like consistency and routine. Sensorial exploration, understanding the world through touch, taste, sound, sight, and smell. These children are constantly learning and absorbing new language and vocabulary. They are in a period for the development of movement, which includes both large whole body movement and fine motor control, including ongoing development in the use of their hands. Dr. Laura Flores Shaw frequently reminds us that as humans, we aren't born to think, but born to move. Another characteristic of this period is fascination with tiny, minute objects. And children in this period also love music. So let's start by talking about our children who are toddlers. Generally, these are the children from about one to three. As I mentioned before, their attention is drawn to tiny objects. They also absorb language and ideas. It is important to speak clearly and offer accurate and new vocabulary. For example, Zoe is holding and looking at our globe. Zoe, when you are finished, can you please put the globe back on the shelf? Just because a child can't articulate the words yet, they are listening to everything you say and taking it in for future use. Some other things this age can do are things like sorting. For example, cutlery. They can separate the forks and the spoons and put them in separate containers. And once they move beyond that, they, you could add different size forks or different size spoons. They could be matching things like socks or different cloths. They could be pouring and spooning initially things like grains and then water. They could be peeling and cutting with dull knives like mandarins, bananas, and carrots. Or they could be opening and closing jars with lids. Here I've got a couple samples of some that I found in, in my drawer the other day. And I realized if you look for ones that actually had something in them that had at one point had a strong smell, that also will appeal to the toddler age because not only can they open and close them, but they might be interested in smelling the jam that was once in there, or even the cream that was once in the jar. Also for this age, even something like 
old fashioned perfume bottles, which again have a smell, but they have a different type of knob at the top that the child could be taking off and on. Although I couldn't find a nut for the largest bolt here, a collection of a couple of these was a favorite activity of my children when they were toddlers. Thanks to my dad who made a trip to the hardware store, or some of you may be able to find some examples lying around your house, you can even put together a nut and bolt activity for your toddler. Despite the fascination with the minute, these should also not be too small so that they swallow them, obviously. And remember, they love to explore even with their mouths. But with, when you have a nut and bolt, it gives the child the opportunity to not only put the nut on the bolt, but also screw it towards the other end. This is also a time when children can start their own self-care. Things like dressing, brushing hair and teeth, washing hands, which is always obviously so important right now, blowing their nose or even sneezing in the crook of their arm. One of, the, one of the many gifts right now is the gift of time. So we have lots of time for our children to take the time to get dressed on their own. And we're not rushing out the door like we normally are. Language also, not only talking to our children, but letting them look at books on their own and reading to them are also important. The personal interaction involved with reading to a child is very different and generally more effective than having something digital read to them. I'm not suggesting in this time of being with them and possibly working with other children and getting your work done, you should not use some of the digital tools available for reading, but they can't replicate you being and reading with your child. Dr. Tiffany Munzer, a fellow in the developmental behavioral pediatrics studied toddlers who had a story read to them through an iPad with enhanced graphics, a simple ebook without graphics, and being read to by a parent. The New York Times summarized Dr. Munzer's findings, which stated, print books together generated more verbalization about the stories from parents and from toddlers, including back and forth dialogic collaboration, which means what's happening here? Remember when we went to the beach with dad? And all of this assists with this important period of language development, which only happens when we read with our children. Technology cannot replace the adult interaction. I view technology at this age as entertainment rather than for learning. Here also, which is included in your resources, is a very simple free downloadable seven page story to read to young children, both toddlers and preschool age, about why we are staying home. Thanks to Angie Ma for creating and freely sharing this resource. Okay, let's talk about our three to six year olds now for a few minutes. For our three to six year olds, some areas of activity like the classroom we can consider for home are practical life, which includes all the activities for self care, independence and early concentration. The sensorial area, again, activities that use the five senses touch, seeing, hearing, smelling, and tasting. Continued language development, much, much of what has gone on in the first three years starts to manifest itself in their increased ability to express themselves. Children become interested in activities associated with numeration and geometry at this time. And also all of the things involved in culture, art, music, geography, history, talking about how others express themselves and live in other environments how we are all so similar, but also so unique. Also be sure, as I've said before, your child knows how to wash their hands properly and can do it themselves. So have a stool in the bathroom or provide whatever they need to wash their hands regularly. Many Montessori classrooms have had forever hand washing as an important activity and require children to wash their hands before they start their work in the morning or afternoon as well as before they eat and after they come in from the outside and obviously after they have used the bathroom. Here again is a link to a video that shows the effectiveness of soap when trying to protect children against germs. I believe learning to wash hands was one of the very first lessons Dr. Montessori gave her children in San Lorenzo, Rome in 1907. 
In Montessori, we also talk about practical life, which are often the many activities that the child is interested in, therefore concentrate with, and help to develop their own independence. Practical life activities are also the things that children may see us doing that they want to do as well. Help with the cleaning, or the serving, or setting the table, or even polishing their shoes, or our shoes for that matter, or the doing the laundry and preparing their own snack. Try and designate a shelf in the kitchen that is accessible for the child where they can get things to prepare their own breakfast. Try and find things in your cupboards or drawers that you already have that may be child size. Here I've, pulled, I've, I've dragged out a few examples from my cupboard of some pictures I have, for example, that easily uh, a three to six year old could use. In fact, they could even use these to do some transferring of liquids. I also found some clothes pegs that they could be using to help hang clothes on a clothes horse or if we are so lucky to have a clothesline outside. We could also encourage children to use some kind of brush not only to brush vegetables, but if need be have a suitable one as well to brush their nails when they're doing their hand washing. And I even found in my drawers a little tiny whisk that with a little bit of soap in the water. The child could spend time seeing the bubbles that might emerge as they whisk over time. I'd show you, but I don't want to spill water all over my computer while we're doing this. Lots of practical life ideas, anything around the house, cleaning windows, hanging clothes to dry in the clothes horse, folding, folding dry laundry, food preparation, setting the table, watering the plants, and even caring for pets. These are all activities that these young children love to do. A favorite activity for many children is food preparation and cooking. It uses math, language, as well as develop practical life skills, critical thinking, and with a little bit of setup can often be done independently. This helps to instill in the child what is involved in one of our human fundamental needs, nourishment, in the importance of others in providing our food. Here I sh I'm showing you an example of a book that my children used to use years ago, but is still readily available called Pretend Soup. It's a cookbook that allows children to do recipes, many of them on their own, using simple diagrams so they can work through the step-by-step -step instructions and sooner or later prepare something delicious for them to share with you and your family. Sensorial and language. Here are some other ideas for sensorial and language activities. Labeling the environment for early readers. You could make labels to go around and place in the environment. Things like mat, cat, dog, mop, hat, cup, mug. If you write these slips out and have the child read them and find these in the environment, they take great pride. Take out a set of markers or crayons and have them find objects that are the same color, for example, red, yellow, or green, and find other and collect other objects that, are this, that match those colors. Also, you could introduce some simple puzzles if you don't already or, or rotate them in your home if, you, if they are regularly used to using them, putting maybe one or two out at a time. Simple puzzles of all types, particularly knobbed ones, where the pieces have a knob, are really important for your child's fine motor control. Many items in Montessori early childhood development classrooms have knobs, as, which, as I said before, which help with the fine motor control. Another type of puzzle also are puzzles where there's something to discover underneath the puzzle piece. These often give the children great enjoyment if they can see something that they can discover when they take the piece out. You can also offer your child activities like Play-Doh, crafts, and other games. Or you can do treasure hunts for shapes like triangles, circles, or rectangles, or even I spy games. Children can also do counting and math exercises at home. This material in a Montessori classroom is called cards and counters. At home, your child could be counting and sorting many objects and place them with the numeral that represents the quantity. You could make the paper numbers and have them lay out the objects. 
for example, marbles or buttons or jelly beans if they can resist eating them or whatever else you can gather. Ideally, if they're doing the numbers one to 10, ensure there are only 55 objects. This becomes the control of error for the children to do this on their own. They could also take the same numbers and find the quantity for each of an object, three marbles, six cars, two dolls, etc. Finding peace is also not just important for us, but for our children during this time. Check out the link at the end, which speaks about the silence game and offering children in Montessori more experience with silence. In the classroom, this is often done in a group initially, but then offered as an individual activity for the child to choose whenever. All the exercises in practical life, especially the grace and courtesy lessons, are indirect preparation for the silence game. Children learn to control and perfect their movements, pushing in a chair qu quietly and carefully, walking around a work rug on the floor, pouring the rice carefully without the sound of even one grain spilling on the table. These activities help children develop concentration and precision, as well as social awareness, as they wait for their turn without disturbing the classmate who is working. They learn to speak softly in response to a teacher's quiet voice and to stop moving and listen when a chime is rung or the lights are turned out. This explanation is from the Montessori Services website, which is a source of many objects and supplementary material used in Montessori classrooms. You may also want to check them out if you are looking for some additional resources for home. This, this silence game offers the experience of peace, calm, and quiet for the child. And things you can do on the same topic at home might also help with the same peace, calm, and quiet at home at this time. Here are a few other resources and books for zero to six and beyond. The Creative Family, a great resource of ideas you can do with your children, many of them inside. The, uh, the new book, The Montessori Toddler by Simone Davies, which offers many, again, home activities for parents to do with your toddler, and some understanding of Montessori. Kids in the Kitchen, which is simple recipes that build independence and confidence the Montessori way, and How to Raise an Amazing Child the Montessori Way by Tim Selden. Okay, let's move on to our elementary children, our six to 12 year olds. Let's talk about some of their needs and characteristics for a few minutes. First of all, one of their greatest characteristics is their imagination. They have a capacity to think about big ideas and things that are beyond the moment and the reality. Hence the great success of fantasy books and even our, our favorite these days, Harry Potter. Morality and justice is also important to these children. They often think about the idea of fairness, personal and social. It's a great time for them to imagine and think about how this present situation may be impacting others. It's also an opportunity to recognize and show appreciation to essential service workers. This notion of how we interact and need each other, not only in our families and communities, but globally, is the opportunity for our children to develop a system perspective on things. Culture, this is understanding of our own cultural traditions, but also the authentic ones of others. At this time of Easter and Passover, it'll be very interesting to talk about how many different people will celebrate traditions that normally have been celebrated in very different ways. Social and peer interaction, this is incredibly, also, incredibly important also for the elementary child. Everything revolves around peers at this age. Hence the huge popularity of group games and the constant question of who's winning and who's not. And then finally, abstraction. Because of their imagination, increased experience, these children become much more abstract in their thinking. And particularly as they move into the upper elementary, often many of them rely for shorter periods of time on the Montessori material we have in our schools. Okay, let's talk specifically about our six to nine year olds for a few minutes. I would encourage for our elementary children to have them at all ages plan every day. Many of them may be used to doing this on their own, but if they need your support, you can help them with it initially. They also could be helping with younger children if you have them at home. I would encourage them to do lots more cooking and cleaning of things that they can do and help, out, help around the house with. I'd encourage them to read every day, and they can also be listening to podcasts and audiobooks. 
This is also a time where you could set a routine of doing math facts. Arts and crafts, things like drawing, knitting, crocheting, sewing, are also all very fun and appropriate kinds of things for the children to have time to get into right now. They could also be journaling each day, which could be, include a picture every day or writing or both, depending on their writing level. And I'd also encourage at this level to connect with a friend digitally for a limited amount of time, most days or at least a couple times a week. You could also do other things like create a treasure hunt, care for plants, plant seeds, clean out drawers and closets and cupboards, and even your child might be able to plan a meal. Daily reading will be important for your elementary age child. There are lots of ways to do this and it may vary depending on your child's reading ability as well as their age. One thing to consider if you're looking for more books while at home, there are many resources you can now download audio and digital books, including some from your local libraries. Also many book media services like Apple, Audible, Penguin, etc., are offering free access or books at this time for their children's collection. Use a Kindle, iPad, or whatever digital reading device is necessary. Although still reading from the hard copy is also important, particularly for children under nine. In these times, I suggest digital complements reading and the reading and reading the real book does not, re does not replace the digital, sorry about that. If you are also looking for ideas for reading, check out the recently released book by Pamela Paul and Maria Russo, How to Raise a Reader. The YouTube video link is a short interview with the authors, but there's also many other summaries online about this book if you can't access it right now. Resist at this age, the six to nine age that is, writing or drawing online. Here's a great resource for all different types of paper designs that you can download so that your children can use graph paper, lined, and even dotted paper for writing, math work, or even creating designs. This website also offers many, many more online formats for paper. Even for the older child, ideas like comic panes and other more sophisticated options like calligraphy paper paper for them to be doing some of their own calligraphy. There are also lots of ways for them to continue activities for math or numeration. Here is an example of a young person doing the stamp game. Years ago, I made a paper version of this for children I worked with at home. There are also now online versions of this that can be used at this time. The online Montessori stamp game and pegboard for seven and eight year olds for, for seven or eight year olds and up. Thanks to Ryan Nevius, who also trained in Bergamo for creating these resources. You can also do math facts for both playing cards and take up by taking out the face cards. Depending on the age and ability, you could do addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Choose an operation and draw two number cards, for example, six and three. So it could be six plus three or six take away three or six times three or six divided by three. Kids can do this themselves or with each other. Also, some of these activities could be done online with other friends at the same time. I've also provided you a link to some other math facts and drills that they could practice doing, and they're also, many of them are done in game format. Here's another beautiful activity which could be done with other objects as well, thanks to you kids, the you Kids window on their Facebook post. Don't forget activities like board games, playing cards, cribbage, crossword puzzles, word searches, dots, dot to dot. The other day, I went to the drugstore to stock up on a few items and noticed they had even lots of these books for these kinds of games. There's a word search book that I found when I was there. Let your child choose these, which one, and also help them with the appropriate difficulty. I also dragged out in preparing for today's webinar a dot to dot book that my children used to have that actually has dot to dot from one to a thousand. The other idea is family dinners. As I talked before, there are things that we can do now that we actually couldn't do previous to the, to the situation we're dealing with today. Take time for family dinner. Give children the opportunity to set the table beautifully. They wait, might want to pull out the candles or, or different um, place settings or 
put out wine glasses for them to drink their water or milk out of. All of these opportunities for the children to take care and beautify your setting and celebrate your time together as a family will help with, your, with this period of time. I also offer another mental health resource for lower elementary. This website offers a little workbook for children and parents from five to nine years of age, which talks about other life lessons and helps children work from fear to hope. Okay, let's talk about our nine to 12 year olds now for a few minutes. I would encourage, as I said before, for them to also be setting a plan for each day. Also, they could be listing five things they can do to help others and decide each day which one they're going to do. Let them check in virtually as well with friends. Let them write letters for distant family members and either scan them or email them or even still mail them like the old fashioned way if that's possible. Encourage them to continue reading and also listen to podcasts or audiobooks. I'd also encourage them to keep a journal and to maybe write every day about this very unusual time. I'd also encourage them to continue to practice math, operations, and word problems. Some story writing ideas they could do. There was a recent book that came out called What If Soldiers Fought With Pillows? And here's some ideas from this book. What if soldiers fought with pillows? Have them write a story about that. What if battlegrounds were soccer fields and spectators cheered for every team? What if we simply asked more questions? Have your child write about that. And the many more examples in the book if you decide to get it. Another great math problem or fun activity for your nine to 12 child, particularly the upper level of the nine to 12, or even possibly your adolescent, is the four fours problem. Using four fours, try and calculate each number from zero to 20. They can go further if they choose. In fact, apparently you can go up into the hundreds. To do this though, they'd need to use addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, brackets, and square root. For example, four plus four plus four equals 16. Or four divided by four plus four divided by four equals two. This, here's the link for this math is fun puzzle. And I would recommend they don't look up the answers until they've at least taken this, taken time to look, try and do this for a couple hours. I also recommend you check out a new Facebook page that's been created in the last couple of weeks. It's called Montessori Elementary at Home during school closure Facebook page. It's a private group, so you need to apply, but every day, many, many resources are being added for parents and also just general support for parents in terms of frustration and how to work with your children. Many Montessori teachers as well as parents are on this page and can help out. I also discovered recently TED-Ed. The TED Talk um, group also has a whole educational division. They have hundreds of short educational videos and talks. And with this new situation, they have released TED-Ed for homeschooling. And each day they, they send out a daily newsletter of lessons depending on the levels you sign up for. They have lessons for, for elementary, middle school, high school, and even university. Things like learning about Viking ruins or why we fear the wrong things or who was the world's first author and many, many more things. One of the other things that's happened is many art galleries and musicians and everybody in the arts community are trying to find ways to put their work and engage you online. I know the Ontario Gallery of Art has many activities right now, our local museum London and London does. And I recently learned, out, learned about the LA Getty Art Museum Challenge. The rules are quite simple. Look through their catalog online of their various pieces of art. The interesting thing about this is you actually can see many things that aren't necessarily on display. Pick your favorite art and find three things lying around your house and use them to recre recreate the artwork. This activity and many of the others being offered through art gallery websites are suitable for young and old. And they're a great way for your child to spend time looking at art as well as doing some very fun activities. 
Some of the things I saw online on the LA Getty Art Museum website are unbelievable and very fun to look at. We'll very briefly talk for a few minutes now about the 12 to 18 year olds because you may have, some, have them as well at home. Some of the things these children need are personal dignity, a sense of identity and belonging, heroes and role models, and social justice. This is also an age where sometimes they go inward. So during this time of this coronavirus, it's important to keep talking with your adolescent children. I'd encourage this age as well to also set a plan for their day. Continue reading and listening to audiobooks or podcasts. Encourage them to journal, not just about what's going on in their day, about, but about their feelings. Encourage them to write about heroes and why and to research them. They can also research some social justice issues. There's many topical ones right now. And also they could do some mathematical and geometrical activities too. Depending on your child's school, they may have more than enough to do many days and just need some breaks or maybe at loose ends looking for things to do to keep them challenged. I recently ran into a former student who is now in grade nine who has taken it upon herself to renovate her basement and with some distant coaching from a neighbor has now drywalled, painted, and presently installing a subfloor in her new bedroom in the basement. Here are some examples also of some websites for math. The greatworkinc.org gives many free math activities for adolescents and check out the daily reviews as well that they're offering for now. They are also offering some uh, the 10 simple questions and they've got a second series of the 10 simple questions that they just posted. As well, there's some other free online math videos included with your resources. As well, keep in mind that children can be outside, skipping, playing hot scotch, kicking the soccer ball, as long as they have outdoor space that's safe and they're not, they're, they're keeping physically distanced with others. Also, there's the Montessori Parent Coronavirus Survival Guide. This is a collaboration of a number of international Montessorians who within a couple weeks created a 120 page guide for parents on how to talk to your children, how to support yourself and offer many other activities for your children to do at home in addition to some of the ones I've offered today. Also Guidepost Montessori Home offers learning resources. And there, as I said before, there are many, many other online support groups, Facebook groups, etc. Just reach out for whatever you need. I wanna leave you with a snippet from an article by a Montessorian, John Snyder. It's called Homework, Not Homework. Homework consists both of the child's active involvement in the life of the family and in personal projects they undertake on their own. The homework idea list to which the child and the parent may propose additions offers the important element of choice. Montessori homework seeks to incul inculcate learning as a way of life. Like it or not, this unique situation brings learning squarely home. It was with us all the time, but not always consciously. Everything a child does or does not do becomes part of their education. So keep in mind in everyone's, everyone is learning right now, every second of the day, how to be in our new reality. Give whatever control back to children while also taking control of your own choices. Offer limits, offer choice, respect when they want to do things, but don't always give them a choice to not do them at all. Would you like to do it now or later? And no matter how much we plan, recognize every morning it is a new day with new realities. So before we move on to some questions, I'd like to leave you with the wisdom again of Dr. Maria Montessori. We shall walk together on this path of life for all things are part of the universe and are connected with each other to form one whole unity. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and to Guidepost Montessori. And I look forward to hearing some of your questions. Thank you, Margaret, so much. That was lovely. Um, I especially love the reference to John Snyder. Um, he's just such a lovely human being that we miss. 
dearly. Yes, we do miss him. I, did, I, I neglected to mention that he passed away a couple years ago. Yeah, I was fortunate to overlap with him at one um, summer conference. Great, great man. Um, I wanted to talk just briefly about a couple of our Guidepost Montessori offerings, um, and then I'm going to pass things over to my colleague, Edward. Um, if you're already part of our Guidepost network, you're likely already aware of these, but we are just about to offer them um, up to our outside families who are not currently enrolled at one of our schools. So we've got free and upgraded services to help support you during school closures, and we have two offerings if you are a parent with children under six years old. So the first is a free program that's called Family Framework. Um, and I'm going to actually read from this list so that I make sure I don't miss anything. It will give you access to hundreds of free Montessori articles and activity ideas that are curated and organized by topic. Um, you'll be able to join public online community events like this. Um, it will give you access to our Montessori community online forum. It will equip um, parents with daily and weekly Montessori at-home toolkits. Uh, many of the offerings that Margaret mentioned tonight and, and more. And there are daily morning virtual group circle times uh, for children. And this also comes with a free initial consultation session with one of our parent concierge experts that I highly recommend everyone take us up on if you have children under six. Um, our other offering is called Family Framework Plus. Um, and this is a highly personalized program that will be made available to outside families beginning next week, April 8th. So I'm giving you a little bit of a preview. Um, I know parents are going to be clamoring for this offering. There will be a dedicated teacher um, and three classroom touch points, um, as well as some one-on-one -on -one parent coaching and, and more. So we'll be giving more extensive details about this at our webinar that's happening next week on April 8th. And what I recommend doing now is going ahead and making that one-on-one -on -one, uh, consultation appointment with one of our parent concierge experts to learn a little bit more. And you can do that at elearning.guidepostathome.com. So if you don't have a pen handy, not to worry. Um, I'm gonna send these out in a follow-up email tomorrow, but I'll say it one more time um, in case you want it. That's elearning.guidepostathome.com. Um, and if we have any families here with elementary students, um, we also have an incredible elementary distance learning program. It's a full day program where we offer small group lessons and individualized instruction. Um, there's a peer community and lots of opportunities for your elementary child to collaborate with other children. So if this is something you might be interested in, please do apply. Um, we're accepting applications. You can go through guidepostmontessori.com forward slash EDL, that's for elementary distance learning. Um, again, I'll list that in the follow-up email. It's guidepostmontessori.com forward slash EDL. I feel like I'm on an infomercial or something, but um, <laughs> anyway, I'm going to pass it over briefly to my colleague Edward to tell you about one of our other projects, and then we'll take more questions for Margaret. So please go ahead and write them in if you haven't already, because we're almost ready for that part. Take it Great. Away. Great. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Margaret. Um, as Kelly mentioned earlier, I work specifically on a program that is called Emergency Care for Essential Workers that's rolled out in the United States. As I'm sure we all know, we're living in a very unique time where we are all making adjustments, and that includes us at Guidepost Montessori. We have taken the opportunity and, and closed our campuses momentarily and have begun reopening them uh, specifically to our essential workers. So all of our 40 plus campuses across the US are gonna be offering this emergency care, which is for children aged zero to 12, on our campuses in very small cohorts of less than 10 people per classroom, including our guides, so that we can maintain CDC guidelines for social distancing, but also give the care needed for our first responders. Uh, right now, you know, when we hear essential worker, I think we all go directly to hospital and healthcare providers, but that really is a wide variety of individuals that we need on a day-to-day -day basis to support the infrastructure of society. So we are excited that uh, this past Monday, actually about a week and a half ago Monday, we opened with 11 campuses, and then by Tuesday of next week, we'll be up to uh, about 30 of our campuses open, uh, offering this care to first our, our families that are within our network that are already attendees at our campuses across the US, but now to external families uh, to bring them into not only the world of Montessori, which is something we're excited about, but to offer that calm, serene environment 
for uh, the children of these essential workers while they're out uh, really keeping society running. So if you happen to know anyone, you can visit guidepostmontessori.com slash emergency care, and you can pass that along. Uh, as well as I know Kelly was talking about some references and some resources that Margaret cited throughout her presentation. And so that can also be shared, but it is uh, right when you go to guidepostmontessori.com, you'll see right at the top uh, where we are already taking enrollments for campuses across the US. So if you have any questions, you can feel free to, um, again, maybe uh, you can ask them offline after this, because I think Margaret's presentation is much more uh, pertinent today. But you can see there is a, an email address where all questions can be brought to. And it's very simple, emergencycare at guidepostmontessori.com. So again, I also now feel like an infomercial. So thank you all so much. And thank you, Margaret, again, for your time today. It was an, a lovely presentation. Thank you, all right. All right, um, let's see. Let's get to some questions. We, we have a comment first, actually. It says, thank you from British Columbia, Margaret. No questions. You were very thorough, and we appreciate the resources. Um, Let's see, we have a question that says, for four-year-olds, besides counting activities, are there some other math activities we can do that are not too advanced? Well, I think one of the things that we do in Montessori, which is sort of a combination between both our sensorial activities. First of all, I should state very clearly, I am not toddler or, or, or three to six trained, although I worked in a school with many of those teachers for many years. So I'm just going on my, um, watching my own children and what I know from being head of school. So I, I just thought I should give that caveat. Uh, but one of the things I, I, one of the things that comes to mind are just a lot of the comparative kinds of things that we do, which is kind of a combination of sensorial, but it also prepares them for math. So for example, one of the pieces of material we do in the sensorial is the red rods which compares length and so it helps the child order the rods according from smallest to largest well those rods then lead to the idea of numeration so then they can count the different sections along the rods when they become the number rods which look very similar to the red rods so i think a lot of i think you would be surprised the number of things that if you're just getting kids to sort and to count and to even take some objects and put them together and say, how many do we have now? You know, those are all lots of activities that are actually indirectly reinforcing a lot of mathematical skills. I would also suggest if, if you do have an older child at home, even a six or seven year old, if you've got a four year old, they can actually be doing some of this with them as well. I mean, we need to keep in mind that our children are often far more independent than we realize. And so giving them opportunities to do these things on their own is also very satisfying, not just for us in at this time, but for them to have that confidence. That makes sense. Um, let's see, someone asked, I'm interested in the offering for children under six, but I didn't catch it. Um, sure, that would be elearning.guidepostathome.com. Um, all right, let's see, other questions for Margaret. Uh, I've got someone that says, how easy is this to implement if my child doesn't have a Montessori background? So I meant to say this at the beginning that, you know, I certainly uh, apologize for maybe using a few, few, many, few too many Montessori references. But, you know, the, the beauty of Montessori is it really does work for all children. And many of these same activities you can be doing with your children at home, they might need a little more guidance, they might not be quite used to some of the levels of independence that are offered in a Montessori classroom. But it is not to say that all of the principles that we share today couldn't be used with any just about any child. I have a parent that asks, what if my child just wants to draw all day? Well, one of the other things I would suggest right now is uh, give yourself a lot of latitude and give your children a lot of latitude first and foremost. Having said that, though, as I said um, towards the end of the presentation about choice, I mean, there are some things that I think it's important for us to give our children choice within limits. So, you know, I, I think it is important for your children, considering they're not in school, um, to be doing a little bit of reading depending on their level and be doing some other activities that might also have some levels of academics. Maybe they're getting this already from their school and if they are then you may not be, need to replicate those. But if they're not, then I would give them some limits and I would say, you know, let's, let's 
um, let's start. You can draw for 20 minutes now, and after that, you know, let's read together. Or you, you know, could you do a journal? Or if you're going to do this drawing, if they're able, could you write a couple sentences about it? It depends on the age of the child. If the child's nine, they should be writing. They could be writing a page about the drawing. Um, but the idea of, of certainly giving them, I think, choice within limits. Um, or you might even want to say to the child, what would you like to start with? Would you like to start with some writing and reading or doing some math facts and then draw? Or would you like to start with drawing and then doing the writing and reading? As I said before, I think giving them some control as well is really important at this time, just like just like always, actually. For sure. Um, someone asks, should I be worried about screen time right now? Uh, you know, it's a really good question, and I, I think I do think keeping some limits on screen time actually are really helpful. Um, I certainly re understand if children are experiencing more screen time than usual. I mean, generally they're just home more than home way more than usual. They're home all day and and all night. Um, so you know, those days we used to be out at soccer practice or piano lessons or whatever are you know are different because they're not doing those things. But having said that, I think you need to negotiate limits with your children. So, um, and I think the, it also depends on the age. I would highly recommend very limited screen time is still for children, um, particularly under three, but even under six. Um, increasingly though, screen time is also being used by school communities to help them connect with their classmates or with their teachers. So that's a different use of screen time and probably a very important one right now. So again, I would just, I would monitor it. Um, I would say hours and hours it's for, for any child at this point is probably not a great idea. And to help them discover some other things they can be doing instead of the screens, if you can. I also just wanted to note with our uh, distance learning programs, there's the, the idea is that the technology is there for connection, um, but the work is still taking place offline and on paper. I just I do feel like that's an important distinction because distance learning has such a, um, a different understanding. So we're, we're doing it a little bit differently. Uh, yeah, I'm glad you, yeah, I'm glad you said that, Kelly. That was one of the reasons why even um, gave the link for the, the website for the different kinds of paper. So yeah. that, you know, children, you can print out the paper or they can print out the, the paper samples that they need uh, to do their math questions on graph paper or to do their writing, you know, online paper or whatever, because again, what the child does with the hand rather than online is, is going to have a far greater impression than, you know, those hours in front of uh, a tablet or a computer. Definitely. I, I loved that resource. I wish I had known about that as a teacher. I'll, I'll go spread the word among my teacher friends now. It's amazing <laughs> the things we're discovering right now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's another parent that wrote in and said, how do I juggle this with really young children while I also have to work? I think this is a, a very common question that um, that parents are asking right now. Any Any advice on managing that impossible task? <laughs> Uh, yes, <laughs> um, I, I think the first thing is be patient with yourself and and you know to to figure out you know what are the kinds of things that will keep them engaged for longer periods of time. Certainly, open ended activities tend to be um, more engaging than closed activities. And activities, I mean, there is. In, in this day and age with everything that's going on and with your need to work, for, for example, there is some merit in entertaining children. And again, I don't want to, um, I don't want anybody to feel badly about whatever necessities they're having to reach for in order to cope. Um, but, but at the same time, um, I think just, you know, figure out what are the things they enjoy. If it's, I mean, I mentioned a few minutes ago, if they do like to be read to by an iPad or whatever, and you're trying to get some work done, fine, do that. Um, you know, and and but then just keep in mind that if you have time, you know, before bed, that you can do the reading yourself or do some other things. I also, um, I mean, it's different if they're really young. So if you've got, you know, a, a, let's say a one-year-old and a three-year-old, that's pretty tricky. Um, and I'm not sure I have a super magic solution for that age, um, but if they're a little bit older, if they're three and five, the five-year-old can help with the three-year-old. 
So don't underestimate the power of, of older children. And if, if you do have a partner at home, I'd say try and do some tag teaming. I was talking to somebody just the other day and she was saying that, you know, her husband works for a couple hours in the morning and she does her work for a couple hours afternoon and then they switch again, you know, a couple hours later and try and condense as much of their work time as they can um, throughout the day at different periods. Um, there's a related follow-up question to what you were just saying um, about how uh, can my older child who's nine help support my younger child who is five? And I'm sure this is applicable to many people with multiple children of different age spans, but. I, I think there's lots of things. I mean, certainly probably most nine-year-olds are pretty comfortable readers. So, you I mean, they could be cooking together, they could be reading together, they could be even helping them with doing some, you know, maybe simple addition or subtraction or, or things like that. They could be, you know, they could be the ones writing up the little number cards and having them go hunt around the house and find, you know, two objects or six objects or whatever, or even some of those early phonetic cards. I mean, they may need some guidance with that, but, you know, if, if, I, I do think when you give older children the responsibility, because you're not only asking them to help out, but you're also saying that you you have a tremendous value and trust in their contributions to your family right now. And I think having those family discussions too about things are very different than they were a month ago. So we also have to all be different, not just mom and dad or, or um, you know, older siblings, but but even... Younger siblings have to be different. The nine-year-old has to be different. We all need to be doing some things differently to help out with each other. Hope that gives some ideas. Yeah, I think that I think it does. Um, another question asks: um, Any suggestions for outdoor activities for younger children? I'm not quite sure how young, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, certainly outdoor activities increasingly are becoming hard as well, like everything else these days, because we can't go to parks and. We need to keep our physical distance from each other. But if you have some space in your home, uh, outdoor space that is, like in a driveway or in a backyard, I mean, certainly lots of, I, I mean, it's the nice, the good thing in, in Canada anyways, is the weather is getting warmer. So things like, you know, skipping and hopscotch and even good old fashioned jacks and marbles, maybe people don't know how to do those anymore. It might be worth looking them up online. There's a, there's a job for the nine-year-old to look up some of those new game, outdoor games online. Um, but, but, or, you know, kicking around the soccer ball or um, doing, um, what's that, that game, skip it, where they do, uh, you know, they skip different things. So I think there's lots of ideas of things that kids can be doing outside. I mean, kids can also be doing their own little exercises outside and running on the spot. And um, uh, one of the greatest things uh, I've given I've given to my uh, friends' children sometimes my Fitbit, and they can you know count the number of steps they're doing outside or whatever the case may be. So again, it depends on the age, but I think there's lots of things we can still be doing outside with our children. Um, without having to go to the park. Sounds good. Um, I have actually two questions asking if there are any resources in Spanish. So I, I'm not an expert in Spanish, uh, although this would be, depending on the level you're looking for, if you're looking for elementary age, I would recommend you go to the Facebook page um, for parents at home with their elementary age children that I, I cited the link to because it's got quite a following and there may be many people on that uh, Facebook page that might have some Spanish resources as well that they could offer. If you're looking for younger children, I think there's actually a similar Facebook page as well for families of younger children. So yes. same thing. And is there, is there Kelly? <laughs> yeah. So same thing. Um, and now that's assuming you're looking for things that are more aligned with Montessori. If you're looking for just general ideas, again, you might just, somehow put it out to the universe or do a quick resource uh, or do a quick search and see what's out there. I am un, I am just overwhelmed daily the number of new resources that keep coming up. In fact, uh, I jokingly said to Kelly a couple of times, I keep, I, in fact, I think my resource list changed again as of four o'clock today because I kept adding new resources that keep uh, kept emerging. Yes, thank you for that. And just to remind everybody, um, if you joined late, you can access the resources in the panel. There's a, a handouts section there that you can um, 
use the, you just put the arrow down and you can download the handout and have it for yourself. Um, or if for some reason you're having difficulty, you can also email either Margaret and her email is on the slide there, or you can also email community at twohigherground.com and we can make sure that you get that resource list. Um, let's see, I don't know that we have any other questions right now. If anybody has a burning question that they haven't put in the question panel, go ahead and do that so we can um, take advantage of Margaret's expertise, but I don't see anything yet that we haven't answered. I, I just want to make one more comment. You know, I have lots of expertise with Montessori and with being a parent and all those other things. But like all of you, I have no expertise with this kind of situation either. And so, again, I, I just want to reiterate the kindness we need to offer ourselves and each other as we work through this. And even our schools and our teachers, everybody's trying to figure out a new way to do things. And, um, you know, I think it's I think it's drawing on a lot of strength from all of us, which is sometimes hard, but at the same time, um, I hope coming out of this, we will actually be a better community and a better world. I agree. I think there's incredible creativity and innovation happening and community, you know, family community bonds that are, that are strengthened during this time. This is beautiful. All right, well, I don't see any other questions. Um, so I guess we'll wrap up a little bit early, um, but thank you, Margaret. I really enjoyed this presentation and enjoyed getting to work with you and getting to know you better. Um, so please, if anyone has any more questions, um, feel free to direct them to Margaret's email that you see there at the bottom. And we really appreciate your time. And thank you so much, Kelly. And thank you to Guidepost. It's really been a privilege to have this opportunity to uh, offer this webinar, um, although it is very different than what we started out with a couple of weeks ago. Um, and also thank you to Guidepost for opening this up to the pro uh, broader public for anybody to uh, join tonight's webinar. All right. Thank you. Until next time. Thanks again. Take care. All right. You too.